Hello everybody, good morning. I think it's good morning still on my right on. Check your watches. I gave a talk uh, last week in Long Range at the Meetup Forum. On my flight up there, there was television screens on the back of the seat in front of me and I chose not to get headphones. I thought I'd do something else. So on the way back, I thought, yeah, I'll get the headphones and I'll watch something on the way back. And it didn't have any screens for me to watch. And I thought that was pretty good. So I read some paper. And one of the really interesting things there in these papers uh, was an article about fake meat. So let's go over some numbers. This is a Q&A session and you're more than welcome to answer the questions. I've only got a couple. We'll just start off nice and easy. So what's going to be the estimated human population by 2050, 2060? Hazard a guess. Shout a number out from the crowd. 10 billion. 10 billion. We're just about to tick over 8 billion people on the planet. Next question. What's the most popularly eaten red meat in the world? Oh, you're a good audience. Okay, what about this one here? What's the estim estimated increase in demand for protein when the population reaches 10 billion people? Percentage increase demand for protein, 70%. And what the people, the producers of fake meat are telling the world is that you guys can't produce enough red meat. So they should be producing fake meat. They'll do it in a lab or turn a tofu plant and call it meat. It's all about trying to get the most out of our resource use efficiency. So if we don't make a change, we're not going to meet the target and, and fake meat will move in. That's my take home. Okay, in, in 2019, we undertook a study for MLA, which was looking at reducing kid loss. And as soon as we started this work, we realised that it wasn't just about the mortality of kids, it's also about the reproduction rate in goats. We start, part of, we, there were six components in the study. Uh, and this talk will just focus on two of those. One is pregnancy scanning, conversion of kids or fetuses at scanning to marking, and the other bit will talk about the industry level economics. And then I'll go over some of the, the take home messages and the stories around reproduction. So our field study, which is really just a survey, was aiming to look at trying to scan as many goats as we could uh, and track them through to marking. We were able to capture just under 10,000, we were hoping for 10,000, didn't quite get there. It was a very difficult year, 2019. I don't need to give you any more nightmares talking about how bad that drought was, but at the same time, people didn't really want DPI researchers on their farms asking questions and, and looking in deeply into their businesses. But 9,000 is a pretty good number for surveys. And of that population, just over 2,000 were maidens, right? And maidens were classified really as young females they were small in weight and size, and they could have been anything to kid as a one-year-old or as a two-year-old. Box them in, they're called maidens, what I would call first parity, first time joined. And what we observed very quickly was that there were problems with fertility rate in the maidens, but also the conversion of fetuses to live kids at marking. This is a summary, it's a bit, a bit of a busy slide here, but it's a summary and it breaks it into rangelands environment, high rainfall, north high rainfall, south type operations where those goat operations were located. The breeds in here included rangelands and every imaginable cross you can think of through to boar. I guess the take home here for you in the rangelands is that the average fertility rate was pretty good relative to the whole data set, particularly when compared to the high rainfall regions. In the high rainfall regions, one of the characteristics of those farms was there's a fence around these animals, which constricts their browse type and, and limits their nutritional choices unless it's delivered during the drought. Kid survival was better in the rangelands uh, than it was uh, overall. Uh, we had a fairly large range in fertility from, from 45 to 97%, so some really good outcomes and some pretty sad stories. Kids survival also had a gigantic range from absolute disasters to some pretty good outcomes. And that then is reflected in the uh, number of kids marked per doe scanned, ranging from pretty sad through to some pretty good stories given the seasonal circumstances. The properties were, were up at the top end here, 130%. Since it started to range, they're pushing 160s, 170s. 
Okay, so we have an animal that we've known and we've already heard it today that's a fertile animal, can have a lot of kids. Send the females out, bring an enormous number of animals with lots of little tiny ones that hoof. Okay, pretty good, but it's vulnerable. When we break this data set up into, I know this is an adult, I know this is a, a, a maiden, and then there's the others where we couldn't capture that data, they're just described as mixed aged. The key thing in here is that when we know that they are maidens, remember, to kid as one or two years of age, and some of them were kidding as, as two year olds and well grown in well managed operations, the average fertility was very low, less than half. Also of note is among those that were pregnant, most of them are having two kids. 60% are having two kids. High twinning rate. It's a fecund animal. A lot of, lot of kids at foot when they give birth. And we know that as well. When we break this data set up even further and follow these adults or maidens, that we know that they're adults, know that they're maidens, and take them through to marking where, we, where they're brought in known as maidens and known as adults, we start to see some, some interesting patterns. This is a managed environment uh, and our fertility starts to improve in the maidens. But the kid's survival falls apart and that affects the net reproduction rate. One of the properties put the bucks out, got rid of them again, but did that when the kids were very young at foot. So in early lactation, exposed the females again to the bucks. This is one of the things that I've picked up in my sense for the goat industry, is that if I just put the bucks out, I'm gonna get more kids. And more kids means I'm gonna have more animals for sale and it's gonna be a profitable venture. And I completely disagree with that. So what happens here is, if it's dry, so these are, the, these, we turn up at scanning the day after weaning. Okay, so the bucks have come in again, they've gone out of the group, a few weeks later the weaning is occurring, so several weeks later, probably about six weeks later, seven weeks later, the bucks are out, they're weaning, and I'm getting here at scanning saying, right, I, I want to know if it's an adult and whether it's rearing a, a kid to weaning or not. So it's a dry udder or a wet udder. And you can see that the females that are not rearing kids had a reasonable fertility, rangeland environment, pretty droughty. Those that were rearing a kid uh, didn't get pregnant at a very great rate. And if there were maidens, the same patterns there, but the numbers are much less. So just chucking the bucks out to try and get a few more kids, I reckon complete makes your life hell because it's extremely complicated and how do you manage it? In an extensive wild harvest environment, this is happening all the time and it's not your business interest. But if you're moving to semi-managed or managed environment, that's gonna be a disaster because it's too hard to manage. Right, economics, let's look at the assumptions. So we tried to put a cost to the industry on the levels of reproductive wastage at fertility and at kid loss. We had to make a number of assumptions, like how many goats are out there. So this is meat goats and it's managed meat goats. We had census data from 2016 that gave us an idea for how many managed goats there are. We had to make an assumption about how many of those are breeding females as opposed to weathers or bucks that are retained in the system. We also had to put some estimates around the prices. So we turned to the long-term data sets and they were saying that the average carcass weight across Australia is 14.2 kilos. We would take that. And then we looked at the average price, which in 2019, ha, what a joke, how cheap is that? $5.41, wouldn't accept it today, because since we've done the report, it hasn't been below $7, between seven and nine. But those were the prices at the time, and a five-year average price gives you a, a smooth sense for value. So an average carcass weight, we've got average price. And now we overlay onto this, fertility variation and kid loss variation. And we get this national impact to kid loss. And I'll just talk you through the graph. We've got three lines. At the bottom is the orange line, and that's the lowest rate of fertility. So we took an, oh, excuse me, sorry. We took an average rate of fertility, which for this data set was 71%. Okay, it's a terrible year. 71%, it's at the bottom, 71%. But we said, right, one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below. So that captures most of the variation we have in the, in the data set. So at 45% fertility, we've got fairly low levels of response, but and as our mortality on the x-axis increases from 20% to 30% kid mortality to 40 and to 50, the, the cost to the industry starts to climb. If our fertility is 95%, then that cost rate goes up again. And more or less, it's around about doubling. So we're at around about $2 million lost to the industry 
at 95% uh, fertility and 30% kid loss. Okay, these are great number. Let's talk about that same data in per doe. So for our main report at $5.41 and at $14.2 uh, 14 kilos for the, fem uh, for the carcass, we're losing about $8.73 for every 10%, for every female, as our, as our kid loss goes up 10%. So at 71% fertility, right, which is the average in a difficult year, if we increase our kid loss from 20 to 30%, you're losing $8.73 for every female in your business. If we put that to a late February spot price, $8.13, that becomes $13.12. If your fertility is 95%, 95%, we average those numbers up by about 30%. So kid loss is an important cost to an industry when you don't have an alternative commodity like milk or wool. It's an animal that produces surplus animals for sale. That's its business, right? And if your reproduction rates fall off, it'll smash your business pretty hard. What other commodity are you producing out of these animals? And what that means is they're eating grass. And this is the problem with maidens. If your maidens aren't getting pregnant, or if they are getting pregnant and they're not converting those fetuses to live kids on the ground, they've just eaten the grass like the kangaroos. You complain about the kangaroos, we should be complaining about maiden performance. So how do we manage this? This is a little snapshot and it's a graphic that's really hard to get your head around. I won't talk about it too much, but it's an on-farm economic uh, that Trudy and I worked through and we looked at different rates of fertility and the impact it would have on the gross margin. Now, I'll just move away from the microphone. The average price in here is 86% fertility, uh, which is about here for a 20% kid loss. So for each of these graphs, we will reproduce the, kid, uh, the fertility, we reproduce the mortality rate. So this is 40% kid mortality, 30, 20, and 15. And what it shows you is that it's curving. So as your farm system becomes more fully stocked, running extra females in that business starts to eat more grass, and the relative profit that you'll make becomes smaller as you increase. There's gain still from lifting from 71 or 2% fertility to 93%. Tick, that makes sense. If your kid loss is decreasing, there are gains, but they become limiting. It starts to turn over a little bit. And what that means to me is as you transition from a wild harvest system into a semi-managed or a managed environment where you put up a fence, you start to control the reproduction. If you don't keep track of what's happening in the females, you could get caught out with a lot of animals on the ground and no grass and you've got to manage it. So let's go through some fundamentals. So uh, the goat's really cute. It's a lovely animal. You all know that. You're in love with them just as much as I am. Uh, and what I really like about it is that it takes uh, an Easter cycle from a cow, which is 21 days, and it takes a gestation length from a sheep, which is five months. To reach puberty, and puberty isn't just standing heat. That's not puberty. Puberty is ovulation. So a, a goat will reach, any animal will reach puberty when it starts to ovulate. And that's a function of age, but also live weight. So there are some live weight targets there. A rangeland doe will reach puberty at around about 15 kilograms and a boar much heavier. A boar will grow faster, so that's probably around about the same sort of time. Uh, okay, if the animals get pregnant, and we know this already from our on-farm field work, they're having a lot of kids per doe. So you get them pregnant, you can be confident that there's a lot of potential kids there. If you are continually exposing those animals uh, and the seasonal conditions are difficult and it's not raining and the feed base is declining but you want to get them pregnant, you keep the bucks out there and as long as they stay sexually active, those females will continue to cycle. And that's on your side, that's helpful. Uh, they're very sensitive to nutrition. So the losses of fetuses, which is about the conversion of an ovulation rate to a conceived egg becomes an implanted embryo uh, and is recognised as a pregnancy and then you might have some losses between that time through the time of kidding. This is called fetal loss and fetal loss is higher generally in an, in an animal that starts joining lean or if it's young. But also one of the characteristics of the goat is that around day 90 to 120 of the, of the pregnancy, which is three to four months in, they're susceptible to malnutrition abortion. So there's a lot of work that needs to go into understanding what that means and how you can manage it or avoid it. But I, when I compare that sort of stuff to what happens in the sheep, 
you have one animal in the sheep that says, okay, I've got twin lambs in me and I'm malnourished and I'm, things are getting tough. What I'll do is I'll just die because I'll get preg tox and I'm done, right? Preg tox, I'll, if you've ever done a ketone diet, you build ketone bodies up in your brain and it makes you feel like you're not hungry anymore. It damp dampens satiety. I don't need to eat, I'm on a ketone diet. That's cool, except if you're twin bearing you, you'll die. In a goat, they're gonna say, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna ditch these and I'll survive. And that makes sense. It's a characteristic of an animal in a very tough environment. It makes sense, but it's sensitive to nutritional variation. So when you then put a fence around these animals and you say, all you're gonna eat is in the paddock that's in here, and you just drop the ball a little bit, they might start spitting fetuses out on you. That's not gonna help. Uh, first pregnancy does are much more likely to abort than a mature dose. So that's one other characteristic of the female and the young female. So reproductive success is a function of age and weight and condition score in adults uh, and quality nutrition at the time of joining or coming into joining. Tr nutrition is important to pr during pregnancy. Season of birth is a factor and so too is breed. So there's a few things there. Body condition scoring. Now when we got 9,000 something does scanned, I was able to condition score about a third of those animals, which was quite a task because there's no RFID systems in, in these goats generally, not always, but generally. So we had a notepad out and said, it's an adult, <laughs> and which gate did it run out of the scanning crate? Go. And then I'm condition scoring, go 2.5, 2.7, 3.2. And this is the curve we got from three different farms, 3,200 goats. Now it's at scanning, so it's not a predictor of reproduction outcome, but it's reflection. And it's extremely responsive. That's extraordinarily responsive. So as these goats, uh, presenting at scanning at one score, they're much less likely to be pregnant and the number of fetuses in there will be low, so the scanning rate will be down. And as we just creep up a little bit in condition score and we get up to about two, two and a half, we're improving. But as we get these animals up to around about three, they're really absolutely flying. When we allow them to overnourish, they'll start to punish you and they'll increase their barren rate. So there's some really interesting targets that can be set in there in your business around condition scoring. So I can talk about condition scoring for another hour, so I won't do that. But uh, what it means is, if you were to condition score your animals ahead of time, you would put your hand on them and make a decision about whether, whether they're on target or behind. That's all you need to do. So about a condition scoring, this is really for the business of semi-managed, possibly, maybe, maybe not, and the managed operation, where the investment in the animal is getting higher and you need to get that return. So you've got to start using tools that will help you make tactical decisions. You don't want to be out in, the, in their pocket all the time. You just got to make sensible, sensible decisions at key times. So it's tactical, and I strongly recommend it's every animal, and you group them into like types. Best times to do that are at weaning, because these females that wean, a lot of kids are going to be lean, and they need to be improving in condition. And there might be some animals in the herd that don't need to be better nourished. Bad luck girl, you're on fat camp. All the other girls, you're making me money. You're going to go on the cream. Uh, okay, so then I would absolutely recommend drafting the like types. So the lean and the rest, that's all it is. And if you're using this information at scanning, you can combine the two. So if you're using pregnancy scanning, saying, okay, I just need to know if you're pregnant and if you're having twins, no problems, tick. Job done, now I know my numbers and I'm gonna knock off and do nothing about that. All you've done is spend money. If you say, these are my twins, that will drive the production in my business. And these animals, among those twins, are sensitive animals to nutrition. I will, I will better nourish them. I will make a decision about creating a management group. And if you're moving these animals through different paddocks, you just put them in there first, right? If you can make these decisions quite simply. It's not like you have to create another paddock for them, but you're probably gonna do that in the end anyway. Anyway, identify the animals that are most likely to spit the, fe the fetuses out after scanning. It's twins, that's gonna hurt a lot, and they're malnourished twins or the ones that are leaner, and they need to go up. Condition score and scanning. Scan the animals, identify their needs, that'll help you make decisions, and it also gives you a little dipstick into your business, it tells you how you're tracking. It's pretty handy. So evaluate the pregnancy scanning information, not just by going down the pub and bragging about your scanning rate, but also make it work for your business. Get a return on the investment. Uh, and for maiden fertility, uh, for young animals, it's really about weight, particularly weight at joining rather than condition score. So there's two things there. Sorry, it's complicated. 
Uh, and this is a graphic that really is just talking about the energy requirements of an animal as their live weight increases. So these are kilograms on the bottom axis here, and this is how many megajoules of energy they need per day to maintain themselves according to levels of production. The bottom graph is maintenance. Here we have our uh, singles in late, late gestation, our twins in late gestation. Then the next line up is the twins, uh, singles in late gestation and the twins in late gestation. So this is, uh, this just tells us that the twins basically need to eat twice as much as the dry animals. So if you take a dry animal out, you allow feed for the, the ones that are going to drive the business in particular. And scanning helps you make that decision. So one of the reasons we want, why we want to know these animals are twins is because they're going to eat more feed. And of course, if you've identified a dry, you can put it on the truck and get rid of it. So in the semi-managed and managed environments, I strongly advoca advocate pregnancy scanning and you do it 80 to 90 days after the bucks were introduced. There's a narrow window around the optimum time to pregnancy scan these animals because as the fetus ages beyond 100 days, it gets harder for the scanner to identify singles from twins. And that's a problem for the industry and for you too because the first conceived animal, if you've scanned them too late, could be classed as a single and the first thing she's going to do is have twins at your front door. You go, that scanner doesn't know what he's doing. Actually, you've scanned them too late. So it's a function of time, so you've got to be careful. If you're joining for three cycles, you've only got one day to get them scanned, day 100. After that, it gets too difficult to identify litter size and any early, some of the dries could be pregnant. So it's complicated. I'd still advocate in a semi-managed or a managed environment, two cycle mating, have a break and then maybe back up. Uh, okay, so if the user in good nick, let's try to be sensible about these decisions. If the user in good condition coming to joining, two and a half score or better, and you've got good feed in front of them during joining, you can be confident that the adults are mostly having twins. So maybe you just wet and dry the, a few of the adults and see how they're going. But I'd still strongly advocate identifying the, twi the twins in the maidens and separate them for, from that moment through to kidding. And if you're in a three cycle mating and you're scanning at 100 days, you're now finding yourself handling these animals in the middle of their nutritional sensitive period when they're likely to start aborting fetuses. So you need to bring control into the business. So it's difficult, right? It's timing. Wild harvest situation. So really, it's kind of in some ways about managing the billies. Get the billies out, put them on the truck, no problems. Chuck a couple back. What do you do about the females? Managing total grazing pressure. Some of those does might be put on a truck and some might be kept for breeding. So which ones do you make a decision on? How do you make that decision? Well, I would start looking at udders. Udders generally, as a, as a comment, I didn't record udders when we were going around getting the scanning data, the marking data, but as a, as a visual impression of goats, rangelands through to boars, is that udders were generally poor. Now, a, a farmer told me years ago that if your science research is working well and you've had a good impact in the paddock, then someone will see the difference, which is around about 20%. So if I'm seeing lots of poor quality udders, then it's 20% or more. And poor quality udders means bad teats, as well as bad udders. So udders are starting to separate and you might have a lot of bottle teats. There's a low hanging fruit here. So if you're thinking about which females to return to the paddock in the wild harvest system, start by tidying up the udders. It's a simple decision. If a female has a really, really poor quality udder, she's not likely to rear any kids. Boing, on the truck, get rid of her, no problems. Nice and easy decision. Uh, and so if you want to know how to judge whether a female is wet or dry, Clasp your finger over the teat, push into the udder and strip it out into your hand and it should be milk like it's come out of the bottle at the shop. Scanning for fertility costs about 60 cents plus labour. Now I know that yard ha the handling facilities for goats is very much like sheep systems and there's a cast of thousands on the day of pregnancy scanning to get these little buggers running. So that's a challenge, uh, except that that's a challenge. So there's structural issues in handling facilities, as well as how do you get a scanner out. But there's scanners around and they're very good. And scanning for wet and dry or fertility, pregnant, not pregnant, is very quick and very easy to do. You can detect pregnancy at about 40 days. Anything that's dry, not pregnant at wet and dry scanning, scanning for fertility, uh, could still be pregnant. So that's a problem too, and I'll answer questions on that. Uh, continuous mating systems, so some does might be not pregnant 
uh, but still could be scanned not pregnant, but actually could be pregnant. So it's a matter of timing. Increasing the degree of management. So we're putting fences around these animals and we're changing their, their ability to browse. And that means you need to start watching things like weight and growth rate in the young animal. So you can get that young female up to weight for joining. If you want to hurt a kid as a one year old, you've got to really push that harder, which is questionable in its economics. Uh, and if you wanted a kid down as a two year old, you've got more time, but you're still thinking about growth rate and weight. Reproduction improves greatly in maidens with age, weight, nutrition, around the time of maiden, uh, mating. If they're born in uh, autumn or early spring, uh, they've got to go over summer before they start joining properly. It's a nice characteristic of the goat. It's a bit reflected in sheep as well. They've got to have a summer before they join. And reproduction in adults is really easily measured with body condition score. So my second last slide. I was talking to a producer in Queensland. He had 5,000 sheep when I was there scanning his animals in 2019. He had a couple of thousand does. He now has over 6,000 does and no merino sheep. He trades a few merinos in and out. He's built a lot of fences into his system and he said one of the things that really was an epiphany for him was when they're starting to handle their females, bringing in all the, the does and their kids, he takes them in from the big paddock in the morning, they get up early, so it's around Bark Alden, so it's pretty warm, uh, from the big paddock, get them in the holding yard and knock off. That's it, that's the day's job done. Make sure you've got a nice clean muster in the big paddock and you just leave them alone. The next day, up again early, take them from the holding pen and put them in the stockyards and go and have a cup of tea. And he comes back at about eight o'clock and they just run really nicely for him. All the stress has come out of the day. The alternative to that is to take them from the big paddock and force them all the way to the stockyards in the middle of the day and get the jiggers out and really push these animals hard. Everyone's working hard then. So there's two ways around it. Low stock stress handling is that a really interesting approach. My take home messages. Maidens need better management. Separate, separate them and nourish them. They will perform for you. Uh, adults will drive your production. So tidy up their udders uh, and fix up the fences because your competitors in Queensland are the dog fences up and those guys are putting internal fences into those systems to really maximise their grass utilisation. Gemma, that's it. How'd I go on time? No questions? That's great. I'll walk off stage. <laughs>